Hi, I'm Lorraine Young. I'm the Executive Clinical Director of Pitcher Youth Services, and this is... Hi, I'm Jake Abraham. I'm a school social worker currently placed at uh, Cockins Road Middle School. I'm just going to begin and just tell you a few minutes of, um, I'm sure everybody knows PYS, but um, a just brief overview. We've been part of this community for 53 years. Uh, we used to provide social work services in all nine buildings. We no longer provide social work services at Southern High School and Menden High School. The district has chosen to hire um, district uh, social workers. Um, so we are in the other seven buildings. Uh, we are also at St. Louis um, Elementary School. So we are at Parker Road and Hawkins for 28 hours a week. The four out of the five elementary schools, so all of them except for Allen Creek, were there 10 hours a week. And we are at um, uh, Allen Creek now, we are there 16 hours a week. We also have 32 hours a week for special education um, that we provide. So we, we provide social work services in the schools. And now um, we've always provided community um, social work services, but now we are expanding. Uh, we actually have, um, besides myself, one other clinician that um, accept, accepts Excellus and uh, we'll hopefully we'll continue to, to uh, make that more available for people. Uh, the other important thing to know is that we, we do not ever turn anybody away uh, due to uh, financial uh, concerns, we will work with, with, I will work with the person, um, and I do all of that, so it's between me and the person, and that the social workers do not need to be involved with that. And then the other big program that we do um, is through grief, and we have Camp Heartstrings, and um, we have two experts that run that um, program at Nazareth, and it's a three-day grief camp for children. And we, uh, this is our ninth year, and we have 40 uh, people that go through that three-day program. So that's just a little bit about PYS. And if you have any questions, um, always you can reach out to me and go to our website, and it explains everything that we do. And now uh, the whole reason you're here is Jacob. I'm going to let him uh, do the presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Jake Abraham. I'm an LMSW, so social worker by trade. Um, the LGBTQ community has always been a passion for me. Um, I've been doing presentations about it since I was in college, so almost a decade at this point. Um, I've presented to numerous different, you know, populations, kids, adults, kind of everywhere in between. Um, I like interaction, so please ask questions. If anything comes up, feel free to put it in the chat, um, you know, and I'll answer it to the best of my abilities. Um, so we're going to get started. Let me share my screen here. I'm going to pull up my um, presentation and let's get started. One second. Okay. Okay. So tonight we are going to talk about creating affirming spaces for LGBTQ youth. So I've been doing this presentation with Dr. Heatley, who is through U of R. Um, she's partnered with our Barker Clinic that helps see kids at times for clinical services in school. Um, I've so far presented this presentation at Sutherland High School. Um, Barker Road Middle School and Hawkins Road Middle School. We are just doing the secondary schools at this point. Our goal is to hopefully grow into elementary schools as well, but that's not this presentation. That would be a different one. Okay, so I love to start here. Can everyone see that? Okay, can you give me a thumbs up if everything's looking okay for you over there? Okay, everything's good. All right, so I like to start here with this graphic, um, which is the Yusuf recipe. And the reason why I always start with this is because I think sometimes when we're talking about LGBTQ kids, we think of them in a bubble, right? We think about them as only their LGBTQ identity. We don't think about all these other things that are kind of impacting them from, from birth on, right? All of these things that we're kind of naturally born with that also impact who we are along with our identity, right? So I like this graphic because it talks a lot about the different pieces that kind of make up the use, which is who we are. Um, you know, we have race, ethnicity, gender, identity, sexuality, ability status. Um, you know, we have some early additions, which are, you know, socioeconomic status. Where do you grow up, right? When we're talking about LGBTQ kids, it's probably a little bit different for them in the South versus up here in the North, right? There's a little bit of a difference there. So talking about geographic location matters when we're talking about these students. 
um, along with personal experiences, right? So each person has an individual path that they take that molds them, their parents, their family, their friends, their guardians, all of these things mixed together to make us who we are. So I'd like to start out with this presentation with that reminder that LGBTQ kids are never just LGBTQ kids, right? There's so many other things that make up these children and so many other things you need to be aware of that can, can affect them, right? It's, it's so much more than that. The genderbred person is something that most, if not all, you know, people kind of maybe have some, some experience with. If not, that's okay too. I love the genderbred person because I think it really helps us um, talk about gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. So when we're talking about gender identity, we're talking about, you know, the mind, right? That's who your brain says you are. So, you know, when I wake up in the morning, my brain says, I'm a male, right? So I may then express myself as a male, whether that's facial hair or a haircut or the clothing I wear. Um, and that would be my expression, right? So identity is who I am up here. Expression is who I want you to see me as. And sometimes, you know, we're working with youth. I see a lot of kids that, and, and also teachers in that, that are kind of like, oh, this, this gender expression is somewhere, you know, maybe in that, that spectrum, right? And what I always say is, is let that kid express themselves, right? They're expressing themselves in a way just as we do every day. Biological sex is what you're assigned when, when you're born, right? So a doctor often looks at you and makes an assumption based on what parts you have. When we really start looking at this and something that's been talked about a lot more in the most recent years is intersex folks. So intersex folks are folks who may have both sets of male and female, either reproductive systems or other things like that. And sometimes this isn't something that's obvious when someone is born. You can't always look at an intersex person and know that that person is intersex. And I've actually heard quite a few stories of it not coming out for folks until they're trying to have kids. And then they kind of maybe can't have kids and they start exploring it. And that's when they kind of, you know, start to discover this. And basically that just means that you have, have both of those, right? Um, and then sexual orientation is, is who you love, right? Who you care for, who you love. So on here, you know, there's heterosexual, bisexual, and homosexual. We know that these identities that are listed on this gender by person are not all of them, right? And that's why it's so important that this is kind of a continuous line because none of these things kind of end and stop there, right? We think of it as so much of a binary as male and female, but when we're talking about gender identity, gender expression, it can be so much more in the middle that we just don't think about, right? It's just something we're not, we're not as, as well-versed in as maybe, you know, we could be in, in kind of that binary system. But I love this because I think it really, delineates gender identity, right, which is who you are. Gender identity is who I am. Sexual orientation is who I like or love, right? So that would be who I was into. And those things, they don't always coincide with one another, right? Just because someone is, you know, gay does not mean that they're also trans. Or if, if they're trans, that doesn't mean they identify as, as um, you know, gay or lesbian, right? There can, there can be both of those things. So I like to delineate the two because I think they get so squished together that we don't really see that they're, they're really kind of two separate entities. Um, so this is just a, a small graphic. We're gonna talk a little bit about the diversity in the community. This presentation is not specifically about identities um, because I think that we, we more of just kind of, uh, uh, how do we care for these students, right? Not this is a specific student, how we do this, but this is just shows you how many different identities that there are in the LGBTQ community. And as I said, I've been doing this presentation, you know, types of presentations for almost a decade. And I would say that there's still almost every time I will do a presentation and someone will raise their hand and throw an identity at me that I've never heard of. It's something I've, I've never heard of. It's something that's brand new to me. Um, you know, and in that moment, I take that second to, to talk to that, you know, student in my case and say, can you explain to me what that means, right? If you want to, that's always up to them, right? And if they don't want to discuss it with me, I then take that up and I'm like, okay, let's, let's research this, right? But I think it's so important to talk about how diverse this community is, because I think we see it as one thing, but there's so many other things that are going on here. Um, you know, and as this says, you know, there's more than 100 different combinations of both of these that folks use. Um, you know, so I, even with me kind of being, you know, in this field for a while, um, I still don't know it all. And that's okay for me to admit, right? Because it, it helps me grow, it helps me learn, and it helps me be able to teach that on to someone else. This is just another graphic because I, I think it's really cool to talk about um, the different identities and how they kind of interact. So on the left, you see the assigned sex as we talked about. Um, so that's kind of what, what a doctor assigns you. Um, and then on the right, we see this huge expansive universe of all of these different identities. Um, one I'd like to highlight is cisgender. Um, so cis, cis or cisgender is a term that's often tossed around. All that really means is that you're not transgender. 
Um, that's that's all it means. It means that your mind and your body match up. That's that's what cisgender is. Um, and then transgender can be anything in between that, right? It can encompass so many other things that are going on here. Um, and I just like these because I really think it shows how everything is related, but also kind of its own separate entity in this universe. And then here you see the same thing for sexuality. Um, the romantic orientation has really been something that I've heard more a lot, a lot more about within the last two to three years. Um, romantic attraction, I do hear a lot about polyamory now, um, and I do hear a lot of queer platonic love, which is really what you see with, you know, maybe uh, a lesbian and a gay man just living together and having that partnership. It's a deep partnership, and they share, you know, maybe a house or an apartment or something like that, but they're not romantically interested in each other. And that does, you know, that does happen. And then obviously sexual orientations, this is not all encompassing, this is not all of them, and I'm sure that there are many other ones that someone could throw out that, that isn't included in this list. But this just kind of gives us a general idea of some of the ones, you know, that are most frequently heard. Um, and then I'm going to get into some data. So this is, this is, this is the bulk of this, this presentation. The reason why we kind of wanted to, to present this to the staff too is to talk about the risk factors that are in these students, right? Because we know LGBTQ kids have more risk factors. And when you combine that with, you know, maybe not feeling accepted or safe, that risk gets larger and larger and larger. So really, we want to talk about these things that are going on and, and really kind of point to what, what the reality is for these students that they're, they're, they're living with. Um, so here, you know, we have 20 million adults in the uh, United States that identify as gay, bisexual, or transgender. Um, more than 2 million adults um, identify as transgender. LGBTQ people live in every community across the state. And then 5.1% of New York adult population identifies LGBT. Something I want to say about these stats and really any stats that you will see with the LGBTQ community, it is not indicative of, of the whole community because you always have people who are not out, who are not comfortable identifying themselves in surveys. So this is not indicative of everybody, right? And that's the truth with all of these stats, which, which is pretty alarming when you think about it because some of them are pretty high to begin with. And then you think about all those other folks who aren't added in, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty alarming. And then this is Monroe County. So 14% um, of the area youth identify as LGBTQ. Something I, I dislike about this graph here on the bottom with distribution, um, it only goes down to ninth grade, um, which is a challenge, right? Because we know kids come out before ninth grade. So kind of where are the, the statistics about that, right? Where, where are our younger kids? Um, because I just don't think that it's very, uh, it doesn't show the whole community. It doesn't show the whole story of kind of what's going on. Because we know that, that middle schoolers are coming out. They're coming out before middle school, um, you know, and, and to not kind of include that can be pretty challenging. But we see here, you know, race, race ethnicity, um, and then we see kind of the, the gender sexual orientation kind of delineation on the, on the right there. Um, LGBTQ is the large term that they use. I wish that they would have gone a little bit deeper into that as well, too. I'd be interested in that. So of Mon Monroe County's LGBTQ youth, 44% um, uh, report three or more adverse childhood experiences. So adverse childhood experiences um, increase risks when it comes to physical, mental health down the road for these students. Um, they can include anything from neglect, abuse, um, substance use in the house, incarceration, um, you know, any of those kind of childhood traumas that we talk about is included in that ACE study. So already these students have this, right? These kids are coming to us and they already have these childhood experiences that happened even probably before they even got to us. 60% reported extended periods of sadness and hopelessness, such that they stopped doing their usual activities. 64% reported difficulties from emotional problems, including difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions. Alarmingly, 32% of report non-suicidal self-injury, 36% have considered suicide, and 22% have attempted suicide. When we're looking at trans folks, that um, attempted suicide goes up to 50%. 50% of trans folks have attempted suicide at one point in their life or another. Something that I always like to bring up, especially when I'm working with the staffs at the school, is that one supportive adult, one supportive adult in an LGBTQ person's life decreases the risk of attempted suicide by 47%. One, one supportive adult decreases it by 47%. How do you how do you how do you not see that as such a huge huge um, impact right? You're, you're, that's a huge impact, forty seven percent. So when we talked about this, I did get some of the information from the Youth Risk Survey for Pittsburgh from this past school year. Um, what I would say is obviously we were in COVID, right? So kids were not as um, around each other as they are this year. So I would bet just being in, in in my school is that these numbers are maybe a little bit different than they would be would have been last year. 
So in 2021, students uh, regarding sexual orientation, students very frequently witnessed or heard issues regarding 11.4% um, of students reported um, witnessing or hearing issues regarding sexual orientation. That number goes up to 15.5% when we're talking about um, gender or, or gender identity. Um, in 2021, bullying based on sexual orientation, 35.8% of students reported that there was bullying based on sexual orientation. 39.3% um, indicated that it, it was um, gender identity and a very serious problem is what they indicated. Um, so we know it's happening, right? We know it's happening. And this was when the kids were still in cohorts, you know, all of that stuff was kind of going on. Um, I'd be interested to see what those numbers are now, right? Because we have everybody back together, um, you know, and, and kind of seeing what, what that would be. Um, obviously those, those rates are alarming, right? Because we want students to feel safe in school. It is important that they feel safe in school because for some of these students, that is the only safe place that they have. Um, you know, so making sure that we are creating that environment is entirely important to these students um, and making sure that we're aware of kind of these risk factors that are already going on with them. Family and school rejection play a huge role for these students. Um, life size suicide attempts for highly rejected LGBTQ people um, young people, uh, it's about eight and a half times more likely um, than those who are low rejection. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's the reality of it. And this is more of speaking, you know, family, home, things like that. Um, when we talk about illegal drug use, we're looking at three and a half times more. When we're talking about risk for HIV infection, we're looking at three and a half times more as well. Um, in my previous job, I worked with almost entirely transgender adults. Um, and I can say that that in that role, um, you know, I, I saw this, right? I, I saw this play out. And a lot of those, those, those adults didn't have the support when they were younger, right? And that's family or school. Um, you know, so I, I, as a clinician, have seen this play out. You know, what happens when you grow up in, in environments that they, they feel unsafe, they can't be themselves, they can't affirm themselves. I, I see that, right? I've seen that in adults. Um, so I think that these, these, you know, things are, they're important to look at and they're important to be aware of. So here's the thing. This is what happens when we, we provide um, positive acceptance, right? Look at those numbers. 92% um, in extremely accepting environments, family or schools, believe that they can be happy LGBTQ adults. Um, and I think what's important here too is we don't talk enough about youth seeing happy LGBTQ adults, right? We don't, we don't talk about that, seeing LGBTQ adults that can be happy because so much of the narrative is solely about all of this bad stuff, right? But this is what happens when we can add in that acceptance, that um, affirmation, all of that stuff, this is what can happen. And then youth who wanna become a parent, they wanna start their own family, they want to do that, right? And I always add that in because I really think it speaks to future thinking, right? When we're thinking about being a parent, these kids are thinking about their future, they're thinking about what that, that looks like for them. Um, you know, and when we're talking about students who don't have that support and risk factors, um, you know, they're not thinking about that. They're thinking very survival mode of, of what's going on right now, what do I need right now? Um, and when we can get them into that level of acceptance, they want to they wanna grow their own families. They want to be an adult. They want to be here. Um, and that's, that's what we want, right? We want them to be here with us. So here are some of the things that are, are, are serious risks, right? And, and I, I always include this because I think there's, there's some, some micro things that we don't really think about happening that may be being said in our houses or in our schools that, that are not the most positive, right? Um, you know, you're pressuring your child to become more masculine or less, or less feminine. Um, you know, you're saying that it's just a phase. Um, you know, you're telling your kid to tone down how they are. That, that really speaks to the, the shame and rejection, right? And when we're talking about, you know, even secondary, right, high school and down, how devastating that is for kids, right, of having the only family, a lot of times that they know, reject them, right, and, and, and what that builds in them, that shame and guilt, is, is really dangerous for these kids. Things that help, um, telling your kid that you love them, right, regardless of who they are, um, requiring other people to treat your child with respect, um, you know, bringing your child um, to LGBTQ events so they could see these happy adults, they can see this stuff that's going on, um, you know, allowing them to engage with that is really important. Um, and, and welcoming, you know, your, your child and their friends into your home, right, of whoever those friends are. Um, it's, it's really important because those kids watch that, right? Kids, kids, kids kind of observe that. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about protective factors for sure. So part of the protective factors here is how do we make kids feel safe, even if we're not 100% sure of ourselves in this topic, right? Because no one is, no one is 100% sure, and that's okay. We're all growing, we're all learning. 
And that's what's, that's what's important. So assisting in healthy discovery and autonomy and acceptance, right? And I think that this comes back to allowing your kid in a safe way to be who they are, right? Allowing those kids to explore. Um, you know, as I was, I was presenting to one of the middle schoolers, um, we were talking a lot about outfits, right? We were talking a lot about the clothes that, that students sometimes, you know, seem to wear. And what I said to, you know, that staff was, um, we've all made choices in middle school that maybe weren't our best op outfits, right? We've all done that. You know, these kids are exploring, let them pick what they want to do, right? We've all had, you know, those outfits that we aren't proud of and that's okay. Um, creating an open and honest dialogue. That's admitting that I don't know something. Right. I don't I don't know that. Can you can you tell me more about that? And if you don't, is it OK if I if I research that? Right. Is it OK if I look it up? Um, but, you know, I always want to hear from those kids of, of what does that mean to you? What does that identity mean? Tell me, fill me in. You know, I'm, I'm honest and I'm, I'm curious about right that open dialogue. Kids read that kids. Kids know that open dialogue. They read it. Um, non judgmental tone to be mindful of body language. Right. Trying to just be mindful of, of how you're sitting with that, that student, whether it's your own child or or whoever. Right. Um, sitting with them and allowing them to um, be there with you in a, in a comfortable manner is important. Um, working with students to find supports at home or in the community. So some kids, you know, they're, they're going to go home to families who aren't accepting. That's the reality of it, right? So how do we give those kids support in places that we can control? So in school, how do we validate that student? How do we allow them to feel comfortable and safe here in the building so that they can have that safety and build those, you know, meaningful relationships and friendships that we want them to, um, knowing that at times they they go home and you know it's it's not the best place for them. Um, being prepared with referrals and resources. Who do you send that kid to if you're not sure, right? If you don't have the information, you don't have that. Who do you send them to, right? And we're going to go over some of the resources in the area. And obviously, here in Pittsburgh, PYS is always available for that, right? And we can always link that way too. Um, and individuals, you know, they want the same things, right? I think that we, we think so much that there's such a separation of this group when they want to feel belonging, accepted, validation, connection. They want to go through their middle school or high school or elementary school, and they want to have those same relationships with other students. Um, and I think that that's sometimes forgotten, that, you know, LGBTQ people are just people, right? They're people who have, you know, this identity that we need to affirm and validate. Um, you know, but they, they want the same things. They want that sense of belonging, that feeling accepted, that love, right? It's, it's the same. Um, and I think that that's really, really important to know. So when we're talking about how do we be an ally, right, in the school, how do we be, do an, be an ally? Um, the visible sticker, right? A lot of folks have seen the, um, you know, safe space sticker. They're about this big. They kind of look like rectangles. Um, something I always say with that is if you are choosing to hang that in your classroom or your office, um, be prepared for a student to walk in and talk to you about it, right? Because that sticker is an indication that you are aware, right? And I think sometimes uh, teachers are a little bit thrown off, um, you know, if they hang that sticker and, and a student comes in and starts talking about the stuff and you don't have to be 100% knowledgeable, right? But at least be aware that you see that sticker, right? And for, for LGBTQ kids, that's a flag that that person is safe. Um, you know, so just, just be aware, right? Just be aware that, that, that that's up. Um, honor and use the name and the pronouns that the student uses, right? And encourage everyone else who's in the know. So this is huge. Um, there's been a lot of discussions that I've had, um, you know, about uh, names, right? Name changes, um, names in the systems, things like that. So as of now, um, Infinite Campus for the district, um, the legal name has to stay. So if someone's name is not legally changed, the legal name still has to be there. However, we do have the option to add in a nickname, which I know is not foolproof. So we're working on that. Something I always want to say is if a student comes out to you, make sure you check with that student on who knows, right? Because it may be more confusing. That's something we've talked about is it may be confusing if, you know, this, this staff member over here is using this name and this staff member is using this name. But what's important is that student chose to share who they are. Um, talk with the student, right? And that, and that leads to maybe more conversation. But I think that that conversation can only help because you're there for that student and you're supporting that student. And you're not going to out that student to someone who they're not ready to be out to. And that includes parents. That includes parents. Um, you know, we often think about, you know, safety at home with these kids, but it's not just physical safety. It's mental safety, too. It's emotional safety, too. You have to be aware of that um, when you're sending kids home to, to possibly um, supportive environments. It's, it's those things, too. It's not just physical. Um, respecting privacy and confidentiality. As I said, not all kids are out to parents and not all kids are out to each other. Um, as, uh, not out to everybody. And what's important here is that they get to choose their process of coming out because coming out is a lifelong process. It's something that they're going to have to do for the remainder of their life, 
they get to have control over that process. We get to give them that control of, okay, you, this is a big thing you shared with me. Thank you so much. Then here's your control. Tell me, tell me who you're comfortable knowing. Give the control back to the student. Um, be an upstander yourself. You hear um, things going on in the school, stand up for it, right? And, and be willing to engage with that conversation. Of, this is not okay. This is not an okay behavior. This is not all right with me. Um, and be willing to do that and use it as teachable moments, right? Of this is, this is not acceptable and we don't, we don't push this here in our school. We're really in all forms, um, you know, used in your school, registration, attendance, um, options outside of the gender binary um, and allow families to share gender and pronouns. Um, we've talked a lot about this when it comes to the sheets that are often handed out by teachers in the first couple of weeks of school. Um, a lot of times teachers ask kids to write their name, write some interesting facts, you know, things like that. We talked a lot about adding pronouns right on, right? Because that allows that student to share with you what they want without having to verbally say it, um, you know, and, and allowing those opportunities and being aware of that and giving those kids the opportunity because the kids who want it will take it and the kids who, who don't need it, they won't, right? It's, it's, it's not an extra stretch. If somebody needs it, then they'll fill it out. And if they don't, then they won't. Okay, using inclusive phrases. Um, good morning, everyone, or good morning, all. Um, my favorite uh, is folks. I use folks a lot. I use folks a lot. Um, but the thing about this is that it took time for me to change my habit of greeting people. Um, you know, it's, it's something that you say. Is a lot of times I think that these phrases come out and they're habit, not um, intentional. But the thing is, is that we have to be aware of those habits so that we can change them. And for me, that was even a greeting at a presentation, right? So I, I start with uh, good morning, folks, instead of ladies and gentlemen, right? Because there may be someone who doesn't identify with a lady or a gentleman, and I just turn them right off to my presentation, right? So in that, in that moment, I say folks, and I always, I always say I'm not from the South, but I say y'all a lot because it's all inclusive. Um, you know, it's just switching your mind for those kind of things. It's just changing it a little bit and noticing when you're doing it too, to be able to kind of correct that. Um, group students in ways that do not rely on gender. Um, don't go boys line, girls line. That's, you know, and, and that was a huge one I've heard about in gym class. Um, gym classes have been the most with that. Um, you know, but we've, we've talked about that, right? That these students, you're, you're kind of excluding them right off the bat. Um, table groups, um, you know, use their birthdays. The birthdays are a big one that I hear. Um, favorite colors. Um, I've heard that one be grouped a lot. It's just changing your thinking and, and, and rotating it so that it's more inclusive. It's just, just kind of that little switch. Um, providing role models, right? Are you showing um, LGBTQ people and adults? Is it in the reading? Is it in the books in the library? Is it you know, talked about? Is that something that's there so that these kids know that there's other LGBTQ people out there, right? Um, building steward and allies. So something that I've, I've been really happy to see is the GSAs in Pittsburgh are, are really strong. You know, this year they've been, they've been really strong, um, you know, and, and those students are, they're, they're great, right? They're awesome advocates, um, you know, and, and listening to them and what they need is huge because they, they live it, right? They're living the life. I can, I can kind of, you know, sit here and, and, and talk, but, but they're, they're in it, um, you know, so I love listening to them and allowing them to kind of build that advocacy for themselves too, with a little, with a little push. Um, model teachable moments, right? We all make mistakes. Um, we all make mistakes and I make mistakes and that's okay. Um, the thing about making mistakes, especially with names or pronouns is you acknowledge the mistake, you apologize, and then you move forward. Okay. That's all. That's all you do. You acknowledge, you apologize, and you move forward. Um, I think that sometimes folks kind of get stuck in that trap of like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but that kind of makes it worse. Right. So, you know, change your change, kind of adjust your, your speaking and then acknowledge, apologize, and, and move on, right? And, and then make that note in your brain of next time, okay, I messed this up, how do I change that, right? How do I do that? Um, and it does take a little bit of extra effort, but that validation and that affirmation for these kids is, is life-saving, as we know. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what's here in Rochester, um, just so everyone's kind of aware of what's, what's going on. Um, okay, so the Rochester Out Alliance um, used to be down on university. It did close in 2019, it's a big shame. Um, because they had quite a bit of youth programming, which was really awesome. Um, I do know that they're working to rebuild the board of directors and hopefully bring that organization back. Um, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that they'll do it because they really do. They really did have, have really amazing resources. Um, Rochester Pride is coming back this year. Um, it'll be July 9th through the 17th. There's a whole week of activities. Um, I always encourage folks that if you're at all an advocate or an ally for the LGBTQ community, check out the Pride Fest. It's awesome. 
Um, and there's things for all ages. Um, I think that that's something that gets you know misconstrued sometimes, but there's, there's kid events, there's family events, there's all sorts of stuff in there. And it's a really, really awesome experience to just see all of that, right? To see all of the pride that's at Rochester. Um, I think it's really great. Um, and then the Facebook group, the Rochester LGBTQ Forever uh, Together, um, uh, they have many social events. Some of them are youth, some of them are adults. Um, I've seen some come through where they've been like hiking trips or trips to the park or, or other things like that. Um, so they're not always kind of, uh, they're, they're differently geared. It depends on really what, what kind of people want, which I think is awesome. Okay, so when we're talking about therapeutic resources, obviously PYS is here, right? Um, PYS is always here in Pittsburgh. And as Lorraine said, you can always reach out to us. Um, we also, you know, UR Medicine, they have really great um, resources as well. They have individual group outpatient therapy. They have an allies group. Um, Trillium Health is for adults, um, but it is a really great service. Um, they are a wraparound service, meaning that they have medical care, um, mental health care, pharmacy, um, all of that. All of that is under one roof, um, you know, and that's really great for adults. And then the MOCA Center is um, LGBTQ and folks of color specific. Um, that was originally opened during the HIV epidemic and has since grown um, to be a really awesome organization that does support groups and social events and all sorts of stuff, speakers. Um, they've done really amazing stuff to really bring um, resources to a part of the community that doesn't typically get them. Um, Gender Spectrum is a great resource um, for just information on uh, transgender things. And then uh, Kids Thrive 85, Teens LGBTQ, they have groups and other uh, resources available. Here is uh, kind of teens, right? Facts and teens. Um, we are seeing kids coming out earlier, but I would say that, you know, this, these are always important. Um, the GLSEN network, right? They sponsor a lot of our GSA stuff. They do events every year. Um, Gender and Sexualities Alliance network. They have a lot of really cool activities for groups. They have linkages to other GSAs. They have all sorts of stuff that's really great for schools. And then the It Gets Better project, I always have to plug the It Gets Better project. Um, I think it's awesome. They have awesome videos. Um, they also have a uh, support line. They have all of these really great celebrities coming forward and, and, and talking about it. I think it's just a really um, feel good project. That's, that's awesome. Um, I, just, I just always have to plug it. Um, and then we see the Trevor project. Um, the Trevor project does have a uh, suicide hotline. Um, they also, I believe, recently launched a transgender-specific um, suicide hotline. They are 24-7. You can also chat online, which I do find sometimes is more helpful for folks. Um, sometimes people get really anxious about the phone call, and you can chat entirely online, and I think that that's been, been really helpful. Um, again, we have Glisten. PFLAG is for families. There is a local Rochester PFLAG group, um, and you can find them on uh, Google. And then the Family Acceptance Project, um, that works to help families kind of work with their LGBTQ child or family member. Um, and they also, I am not sure if they're still on there, but they used to have really awesome videos of, of parents um, expressing their love for their LGBTQ kids, um, which was just really heartwarming. I believe they do it around Pride every, every year, um, Pride Month, and, and it's just been great. Um, and then we have the Trans Youth Family Allies, again, um, just a website. They have other linkages that can be really helpful. Okay, so I know I just went over a lot of information in a very short time, um, but what I kind of wanna just bring us back to is we know that these students are in our schools and we know that they're around them. Um, and what I would say is every person knows an LGBTQ person, whether you, you know it or not. Um, so this matters, right? It matters in our schools, it matters in our communities, it matters in our homes, um, this, this topic matters. And it's really important for us to talk about. And it's also really important for us to provide these students with, with as much support as we can. Um, you know, and, and allow them to kind of have as successful, you know, uh, futures as their, their LGBT or their non-LGBTQ um, cohorts. Um, okay, that's really all I have presentation-wise. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen.